Our next unit is about cell reproduction and genetics. And so we're going to start by talking about cell reproduction. We're going to talk about different types of cell reproduction and why they occur, how they occur, the results of each, etc. So why do cells reproduce? Three reasons. One, it allows an organism to grow. An organism can only get bigger by making more cells because remember, cells are limited in how big they can get because of their surface area to volume ratio. So we can't just be made of giant cells in order for an organism to get bigger its cells must reproduce. Second, to replace damaged cells. A good portion of your cells have short lifespans. For example, skin cells only live about 35 days. So in order for you to still be alive today, you've obviously made lots and lots of skin cells over your lifetime. And third, to make more organisms. Obviously, we reproduce in the way of making more organisms sexually, but also bacteria and some other organisms reproduce asexually by just simply making exact copies of their cells. So to make more organisms, cells also need to reproduce. The one thing that's passed on when cells reproduce is the DNA or the genetic material. And this is important because as long as a cell's got DNA, it can make all those other things that it needs. So let's talk about DNA in a little more detail. So the, all the DNA in a, in a human cell or in any cell is the genome of that organism. So if you were to take one skin cell, analyze the nucleus, the 46 chromosomes you have, the DNA in those chromosomes would be your genome. Um, now, your DNA is packaged into chromosomes. So when we use the word chromosomes, chromosomes are packages of DNA. Prokaryotes, bacteria, have just one chromosome, and I've included a diagram here to sort of show that to you. It's one giant loop of DNA. Eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes, and our chromosomes are not circular like a bacterial chromosome, but they're linear. And you can't really see that from this diagram, but we're going to talk about that in more detail in just a second. So let's go through prokaryotic DNA first. So prokaryotic DNA, or bacterial DNA, is found in the cytoplasm. In fact, it's actually found in an area called the nucleoid, uh, but there's no nuclear membrane protecting it. Also, prokaryotic DNA is what we call naked DNA. What that means is when, when we talk about eukaryotic DNA in a moment, you're going to see that eukaryotic DNA is associated with these special proteins, but prokaryotic DNA is simply just DNA. No proteins associated with it. It is just the double helix, and you can see that in the diagram there. It is circular, I just mentioned that, so it's a loop. There's no top and bottom. It literally is a ring. It also does not contain what are called introns. So if you think of our DNA sort of like a novel, and think of bacteria DNA more like the cliff notes. So everything in the bacterial DNA is important. If you were to take something out of, if you left something out of cliff notes, that would be a problem because then you might be losing an important portion of the story, right? Your story might not be complete. The same thing is true of bacterial DNA. Almost every part of that DNA codes for some important thing. Whereas eukaryotic DNA, it's more like having the novel. It's got kind of the extra fluff and the chapters that are not really necessary. It's got these segments called introns that don't, uh, it's segments of DNA that don't seem to code for anything. They could be spacers. They could be leftovers from our ancestors. There's a lot of questions, and, and we're still learning about introns. But they're basically these gap sequences of DNA that don't actually they're not actual genes. Um, and then also in bacteria, and this will come up more later, there are these little pieces of DNA called plasmids. And I'll just give you like a little preview. One reason why plasmids are really important is because they're small and they carry things like antibiotic resistance genes that allow bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics. So bacteria actually have the ability to pass these little pieces, copies of these little plasmids to each other. So you could have one bacterium that's resistant to, to let's say, ampicillin, and it passes a copy of that gene to a whole bunch of other bacteria around it, and now they're all resistant to anti ampicillin. So plasmids are really important, and they're also important in genetic engineering, which we'll be talking about much, much later this quarter. So our focus is mainly going to be, in this chapter, though, on eukaryotic DNA. So eukaryotic DNA, it's in the nucleus. It is actually in a mass called chromatin or chromatin. You can hear it pronounced both ways. And chromatin or chromatin is 60% DNA, 40%, sorry, 60% protein, 40% DNA. So last semester, I used the word chromatin and DNA sort of synonymously, and I was just trying to simplify. <coughs> but actually, you cannot use this word chromatin for, for prokaryotic DNA. Chromatin specifically refers 
to eukaryotic DNA that's made of DNA and protein. Remember, prokaryotic DNA was what we called naked DNA. So why does DNA associate with protein? So we have these special proteins called histones. Um, and bacteria don't have histones. They still have DNA just like us, and their DNA has a negative charge just like ours, but they don't have histones. So histones are these proteins, and if I was to draw them, they almost look like little pearls, and histones have a positive charge, and DNA has a negative charge. And that's because one of the main components of DNA, which we'll talk about later, is phosphate. And if we go back to our biochemistry chapter, phosphate has all these negative charges on it, so DNA overall has a negative charge. So the opposites attract the DNA and the histones. And so the DNA, which is this little string here, sort of wraps around these histones, almost like thread wrapping around a spool. So our DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins and that's what we call uh, chromatin, this mix of DNA and protein. Also, as I mentioned, we have these sequences called introns in our DNA that don't actually seem to code for anything, and bacteria don't have those. So these are some differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA. Here's a diagram just to show you what I mean about the histones. So at the bottom we see our double helix, then the DNA coils around these histones, and then those histones sort of group together into these things called nucleosomes, and then all of that coils up into the chromosome. So if you were imagining all this time, you know that what a chromosome was in freshman year, was like two little short double helixes like this connected by the centromere in the middle. So you kind of drew it as an X like that. This is, this is not correct. What's actually in this chromosome is this DNA really super coiled. Yes, it is two strands of DNA, but imagine them coiled up to 50,000 times more compact or condensed than the DNA normally is. Now, in a normal cell, if you were to just take a skin cell and look at it under a really good microscope, you would not see chromosomes. And that's because the DNA and the histones only coil up into that actual chromosome shape when the cell's going to divide. The rest of the time, they're sort of loosely coiled, and that's what we call a chromatin. It just looks kind of like a stringy mass. And that's because the only way you can actually read the DNA, do the job you know, that it does, make proteins, it's like a book that needs to be opened. But when it's going to make a copy of itself, or when the cell's going to divide, the book is closed and tightly packed up. That way none of the pages get lost. So the DNA coils up when the cell's dividing. The rest of the time it's uncoiled. Again, the chromosomes are linear. They have a top and a bottom. And we're going to go through the structure of a chromosome on the next slide. Again, uh, this, this picture is in your outline. It shows how the DNA, the double helix, ends up coiling tighter and tighter and tighter into the super tight chromosome at the bottom. So here are uh, a little bit about the structure of the chromosomes. Here are the parts. So the chromosome technically is, or at least one side of it is, one strand of DNA with histones, but tightly coiled. And when the cell's going to divide, it goes through a process called replication, where it makes a copy of that DNA. Um, so when you look at a picture of a chromosome, you've probably always seen them as X's, like this picture here at the bottom. But be aware that technically, this side and this other side are exact duplicate copies of one another. They are identical. And this side is not necessary. So why do we always draw them as X's? Because the pictures are always taken when the cell's dividing. And like I said, the chromosome only makes that copy when it's going to divide. So if you were to take, say, a brain cell that never divides, and you were to force its DNA to coil up into chromosomes, they would look like this. They would look like sticks, not X's. The chromosome would only go from a stick to an X, making that extra copy of its information if that cell was going to divide. And again, the pictures of chromosomes that you always see are taken from dividing cells, so that's why you always see X's. So these two sides are called chromatids. Technically, they're called sister chromatids. And the centromere is what holds the two sides together. This is still one chromosome. So as long as these two sides are together, this is one chromosome, and these are the two chromatids. This is the centromere. You should know this part. And then we're going to talk about these other parts later, but I do want you to know them. So the tips are called telomeres at the top and the bottom. Telomeres are sort of protective parts, um, sort of like the aglets, those little tips on your shoelaces that prevent your shoelaces from being like unraveling and getting damaged. Telomeres are like little caps on the chromosome tips, 
uh, they actually shorten as you age, and we're going to talk about that as well, uh, why they shorten and how shorter telomeres might indicate you have a shorter lifespan. Uh, the top arms are always called P and the bottom are Q. So when they line up a chromosome like this, this would be a P arm, this would be a Q arm. And a lot of genetic disorders, thousands of them actually, we know the exact location of the disorder. Like for example, and this is not real, I'm making this up, but let's just say cystic fibrosis. You might look it up online at the genetics home reference page and find that it's on chromosome 8 at position P23. So that would literally tell you that it's pair number 8 because you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And literally on arm P at spot 23, they've got these things called map units um, of exactly where that's where the gene is located that codes for that disorder. So we, we actually refer to these top arms as the P and these bottom ones as the Q. All right, and again, to clarify here, S uh, is going to be the phase where the chromosome makes a copy of itself. So if you were to look at a cell that wasn't dividing or a brand new cell, this is what the chromosomes would look like. Technically, they would be uncoiled because it only coils up when it's going to divide. So you don't usually see sticks in cells. When the cell is going to uh, go into cell division, it goes through a phase called S or synthesis and makes these sister chromatids. These are identical to each other. And then when the cell divides, each of these will be a daughter chromosome. We don't call them chromatids anymore once they separate. Um, it's sort of like how a baby is called a fetus before it's born, and then as soon as you give birth, it's not a fetus anymore. It's a baby. And the same is true here. So these are called chromatids as long as they're attached. This is two chromatids, one chromosome. As soon as they split, this is now two chromosomes, the, the word chromatid no longer applies. All right. Um, and so to wrap things up, again, the, this is the chromosome before. The two chromatids are here. When the cell splits in cell division, now each new cell will end up with a copy of the information. These are going to be called daughter cells, and they're actually going to be identical to each other and identical to the original cell because all that happened here is the cell basically made a photocopy of its DNA. So one strand of DNA, but technically much more tightly coiled than the picture. Now this is two strands of DNA connected by the centromere. And now each of these is, um, single strands will become part of a new cell. In the lab activity that we started today, um, we were building karyotypes. So this is a karyotype. So a karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes. And they organize them by the location of the centromere, the size of the chromosomes, um, and the chromosomes actually get these banding patterns, which you can't see really well here, but you'll see that in the lab. And the bands sort of match up. They stain them with a dye. This is, these pictures are taken during cell division, so that's why the chromosomes are X's. And um, they organize them into these little sections, and they're numbered. This is what I was saying, like chromosome pair number 8, certain genes are carried on chromosome pair number 8 in every single person everywhere all over the world. Um, so if we were looking for a particular genetic disorder that's carried on chromosome 8, we could check your chromosome 8. A karyotype would not tell us if there's a mistake in the DNA code, but it would tell us if there's an extra chromosome, a missing chromosome, an extra piece or a missing piece of a chromosome. And you could also tell the sex of the individual. The last set of chromosomes in the karyotype is the sex chromosomes. If there's two large ones that look like this, that's XX, and that would be a female. If you see a big one and this small one, it's not a very good diagram of it. It doesn't actually look like a Y, but they call it Y. And that's XY, and so that would be a male. And so that's how you would determine that. If there was a disorder, for example, uh, Down syndrome, you would see three copies of chromosome 21 instead of two copies of chromosome 21. And we're going to talk more in, uh, in upcoming chapters about genetic disorders, but in this chapter as a preview, you're going to be building some karyotypes and looking at how the chromosomes are organized. So tomorrow we're going to pick up with the cell cycle and how do cells actually go about making exact copies of themselves.